Now, I invite uh, the PhD scholar from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences and ex coordinator of American Media Studies Center to introduce APPs. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Kumar. is an independent students organization that emerged in IIT Bombay campus in 2015 as an act of protest against the ban on the Ambedkar Pedia Study Circle in IIT Madras and with the resolve to fight the alarming penetration of Manuvadi and Francis courses in higher educational institutions. From its inception, APPSC has been a collective of like-minded students from all strata of society who wish to build a more democratic campus and to promote anti-caste, humanistic and egalitarian ideas of Dr. Baba Sahib Bhambedkar, Periyar E. E. Ramaswamy, Jyoti Ba and Sabitri Bhai Pui. APPSC has also been striving to be a platform for Dalit, Bahujan, minority and women students from other oppressed backgrounds to raise issues concerning identities, democratic rights and social justice. The group seeks to promote discussions among students about how caste, patriarchy, and pseudoscience play our times. For this, we regularly organize panel discussions, reading sessions, talks, films, screenings, etc. In the past, we have conducted workshops on Jyotiba Place works, on the myths and realities of ancient Indian sciences, and have held talks on commodification of higher education and the skewed representation of women in IITs. We also organize much less an interactive lecture series held in open spaces at night. ADPSC has also played an active role in campaigns directed towards campus issues such as massive fee hikes, gender sensitization and student body lectures. This group was born out of a wave of student movements and it has consistently sought to participate in and re-embed the campus in people's struggles. It has been active in the Joint Action Committee for Justice for Rohit Bemula that came to be formed in Mumbai in 2016. More recently, it has participated in Mumbai Rises to Save Democracy, a platform of more than 50 organizations across Mumbai, which have come together to challenge the arbitrary and malicious arrest of intellectuals and activists that have taken place in the so-called Bhima Koregao Elgar Parishat case. Two years ago, APPSC joined hands with student bodies from other science and technological institutes of the country, such as in IIT Kharagpur, IIT BHU, IIT Madras, under the collective student front called COSTASA, that is, Coordination of Science and Technology Institute Students' Associations. This is with a goal to achieve collective support for student groups to promote scientific temper and campus democracy. The challenges the challenges that APPSC faces in this institute are immense. Given that students are conditioned to think that being political is a distraction from studies, rather than a factor that contributes to one's intellectual and moral growth. It has been three years since APPSC applied for recognition, recognition as an IITD student's body, but the official status has yet not been granted to us due to which we face a lot of difficulty, even for simple tasks such as booking a room or getting permission for holding the programs such as these. APVSC finds itself facing a particular challenge in a campus like IIT Bombay. IITs are premier institutes of higher education and IIT being particularly is renowned for its excellence in teaching and research in science and technology. But it is also a reality that the caste system has permeated its structure and function. One of the toughest tasks we have had to undertake in this campus has been to recognize and name the institutional practices which produce stigmatization of students who avail reservation and discrimination in the name of merit. We welcome the SCST student cell that has come to be constituted in campus last year and we hope that this institutional mechanism can commit and pursue equitable goals in the true spirit. We have also heartened by the most frequently upcoming organized and informal discussions taking place in campus on matters related to contemporary social and political importance. The space for critical thought and constructive activity in campus is becoming more vibrant. In this context, APPSC will strive to remain a platform where the most difficult questions can be raised and where a commitment to 
The democratic ethos in practice is affirmed even in the face of most trying circumstances. Now, I invite Sadish, Golden Group KPPC, to introduce American Memorial to and our Chief Guest. Ambedkar Kariya Kulesh Kari Sarko is honored to start Ambedkar Memorial Lecture Series in the name of Dr. Gita Ambedkar. A political leader, philosopher, who champion the cause of the underprivileged, the radical social theories, and the promise of and training the chief architect of the Constitution of India. Through this annual lecture series, we aim to engage with the scholarship of Dr. Priya Ambedkar, as well as, the, as well as the history of Indian democracy, with special preference for the constitutional rights, Emancipated politics of the modern day system, ideas of social justice, and greater inequalities in modern India. We hope that initiating discussion about discrimination based on caste, class, and gender is crucial given the context of the rising majoritarian impact on Dalits, Muslims, women, and other minorities on daily basis. We also seek American Memorial Lecture to be a platform to address the dismal representation of Dalits and women at all levels of public institutions. In the last few months, we saw the Supreme Court passing a number of votes which initiated such debate on certain fundamental constitutional principles. Critics of this judgment have pointed out that the court cannot interfere in the prior case of religious communities or in the, when judiciary assumes arbitrary power in the name of the constitutional morality, it might also undermine the primacy of the parliament. A study of the philosophy of constitution is required in order to address the nuances of this Diverse positions. We present the first Ambedkar Memorial Lecture titled Seven Decades of Indian Constitution with an aim to assist the students to understand the making of the Constitution and its journey to history. We are happy to have the first Ambedkar Memorial Lecture in IIT Bombay delivered by the former Honorable Supreme Court Justice, Justice Salameshwar. Not so long ago, Justice Salameshwar became a familiar name to the nation as one of the four dissenting judges who informed the nation on how the Collegium of India affects court discretion by bias appointment of judges and general officials. In his long and illustrious tenure, Justice Salameshwar has passed many landmark judgments regarding constitutional rights such as freedom of speech and right to privacy. In addition to that, we also more importantly recognize him as a key figure of our time, who boldly addresses the role of democracy to ensure transparency in judiciary community. Drawing from Justice Salameshwar's legacy as an independent and original interpreter of constitution, we are sure that this lecture will inspire new ways of thinking about the scholarship of the Bihar Ambedkar, history of constitution, and its relevance to contemporary times. Thank you. All the period, all the Ambedkar. The KPC's activities on this campus for the last four years would not have been possible without the enormous support from professors. I cordially invite Abhijit Majinda, professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering, to speak on science and society. Can they be kept separate? Professor, please. Good evening, uh, everyone. Honorable uh, Justice Jiramishwar, the speaker of this evening, my faculty colleagues, dear student friends, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate APPSC for having this talk here and uh, to, to enable us to come out of our cocoon and to kind of get, uh, become aware of like, what is happening uh, surrounding us. So as he has mentioned, that we often face this question that in, a, in an institute that is predominantly uh, a technology and science institute, why should we have such kind of discussion? And like, what is the need of such a body? Also, uh, there is a kind of thought process that tells that the institutes should be depoliticized. Uh, we should not have the political thought process going on. So in, in today's next 10 15 minutes, I would like to ask the question, science and society or politics? First of all, can 
and second, show they be separated. Um, and I would like to kind of try to talk both on philosophical as well as practical aspect. So I will start my talk giving my homage to Mr. Jishwar Chandra Bose. Today is his uh, uh, 122nd part anniversary. And as he has said, freedom is not given, it is taken. I would like to go one step forward and I mean, I would like to say, freedom is also to be protected. It is not a by default state. We always have to protect the freedom, otherwise it will be again taken away. And, uh, to, and that is also applicable for academic and institutional freedom. Uh, as we have seen that in every era, I mean, even if we could want that, but our scientific space gets infringed by religion, uh, political powers, and we have seen that scientists, either their scientific findings or scientists, they, as a person who they are, they got attacked and they face atrocities many of the times. Uh, not just the negative effects, society and contemporary politics often have positive effect on science as well. Uh, for example, we can see that, uh, that uh, the kind of discovery that happened during uh, Isaac Newton's time that was kind of visiting the uh, um, uh, industrial revolution and that was the need of the time. And that's why probably we got scientists like that. We saw also similar kind of plethora burst of scientific knowledge during the Second World War. So it is pretty clear that our scientific discovery, our classrooms, our research labs are not insulated from what is happening outside. So if it is not insulated, should not we be more, I mean, it's not if, if today we are aware of that, uh, I mean, our surroundings which affect us so much. So, as we always keep on saying that, the, or, or like many people would like to believe that academic institutes should be depoliticized, but is it at all possible? Politics controls our science. Politics controls who does the science, who will do the science. Caste, color, race, gender, sexuality, language, everything determines who, who will be allowed to stand here and talk to this audience. If we can look, that we can say, and, and like we should ask this question, like in US, why the academia is always dominated by cisgender white men? Why Indian academia is always dominated by cisgender suburban men? We should ask this question. Similarly, not just who will do the science, what science will be done. That is also often governed by the politics, political will. We need to get approval, we need to get funding. So whether people can do their research on embryonic stem cell or not, whether they will do research on Pohutra or not, but of the time that is being decided by who is right now in the power. Also, what results will be made public? That is also often governed by politics. For example, you may know that when HIV started, US administration took that as a disease, and for a long time, they kind of suppressed any research on that disease because they thought, oh, this is a nice way to get rid of those people. But then when they started to see that it started to actually infect the larger community, they started investing into the research, but by that time it was already too late. Also, this is another very infamous experiment, syphilis experiment. Although the medicines were available, but those medicines were not given to the black Americans, to study the long-term effect of the disease without their consent or knowledge. So it is very pretty clear that what science we are doing and what research will be made public depends on what political force is at power, what political will is controlling us. The people who are, who are I mean, there are many of us who are working in the biological field, we work with pillar cells, 
Those cells are taken from this black American lady, Henrietta Lacks, cancer, cancer patient. Without a concept, and we, saw, we kept on using that for years after years without even telling her family members even after her death. So, not just the research, also the academic media, I mean, what academic, what academic places will come up, again depends on political will. This is a famous picture, Jawaharlal Nehru laying the foundation stone of IITV. So you know that when you start a country, you have to make a choice where you are going to invest. Investing into institute may not be an obvious choice at that point of time. So you need to decide whether you want to invest in AIMs, IITs, uh, IIMs, or in some other kind of institute. So these all are the part of the political choice. Not just, I will tell this is the uh, image of uh, 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 Acharya Prasunda Chandra Roy. And this thing that the science and society cannot be separated, scientists know that very well. And that's why they get into, they get involved with the society every now and then. And as I was talking about, that Acharya Prasunda Chandra Roy, he established uh, Bengal chemicals in the later part of 19th century. And that is the first ever Prana company in India. Now we talk about making India, startup India, uh, taking your lab research to the uh, industry. He started that at the end of 19th century. And he did that just not for profit, just not for money. But there was the reason that he wanted the Indians to work for Indian industry. He wanted to show that Indians also can establish and successfully run an industry in front of the petitions. So the core of the idea, core idea was political in nature. Different scientists decide to involve in the society in different ways. As we have seen in recent past, science for March, people and the scientists all over the uh, all over the world was on street to protest against pseudoscience and biology. Uh, including in Mumbai, we also walk on street. Many people here, I know, I, I know the cases who, who walk on that day. Uh, Professor Arnai is sitting here from the Engineering Department. He was in, in corporate, in a very high position, and he actually took part in protests and like went to jail as well. So the examples are many all over. And many of the times, the scientists, they feel pain, they feel a kind of compulsion to raise voice, to raise concern. And as you can see, that this, this was, and these are the words from uh, Einstein, where he says, racism is a disease of white people. And then he continues, there is, however, a somber point in the social outlook of Americans. Their sense of equality and human dignity is mainly limited to men of white skins. He continues, Your ancestors dragged these black people from their homes by force, and in the white men's quest for wealth and an easy life, they have been ruthlessly suppressed and exploited, degraded into slavery. The modern prejudice against Negroes is the result of the desire to maintain this unworthy condition. And we see similarities, and we draw similarities, I guess we all can. Also, for the students of science and technology, some point of time we need to take some ethical moral decision and to decide our ethical moral compass. We need to be aware of our society, our surroundings. We need to decide in which in which uh, what we will take part, in which endeavor we will take part, where we will say no, enough is enough, we will not get into this. For example, IIT Bombay and I know IIT uh, Anpu also, the chemical engineering faculty members, they don't take any endorsement from Dow Chemical because they say that we will not allow you to wash your hands off from total tragedy. Until that one will take the responsibility of the Indian turbine, the language of Indian turbine, we are not going to have anything to do with it. So to decide what to be done, 
to decide about your ethical moral compass, I think such kind of awareness is very much needed. But also I acknowledge the concern of many people who think that having political debates make the academic or institutional environment hostile. We know, yes, that happens. But in fear of that, if we stop the political debate, we are throwing the baby with the bathwater. So we cannot stop the mantra, the chandi, in fear of poison, because in that case we will also not get money. So we have to have that chandi, we have to have that political debate, we have to have that even heated argument, but without being physically violent. And we need to understand that there should not be any enmity in the long run. I would end this week as our, I mean, this is our constitutional duty that every citizen of India to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. And when we talk about the spirit of inquiry, we have to encourage questions, we have to encourage dissent, we have to uh, encourage even uncomfortable questions in and beyond the classroom. And as we all know that the questions have no bound, so when we allow them to flow, we have to be prepared to face all those kind of uncomfortable questions, but from those apparently uncomfortable exchange, we can, I mean, that is the only way to go forward. Thank you. We are breaking the tradition. We are having felicitation before the speech. Richard Bedo, President of MKS, the staff of Open Organization IATV, will felicitate the chief guest. I invite Mr. Bedo to the stage for felicitation. Sir, please. some difficulty while sitting here, sitting over there, following what was being spoken. For perhaps two reasons, I don't know about uh, how good the acoustics of this hall are. Second is, I have an infected uh, gum problem, which affects my hearing also a bit. So for all these reasons, perhaps I couldn't. And certainly sitting here, it was more difficult for me to follow what my predecessor speakers were talking about. Well, as members of the Indian Institute of Technology, somebody dealing with uh, acoustics may check up the thing later. It's a great honor to be in this great institution. And it is a, a pleasant evening for me to be in the company of so many youngsters. Obviously, I'm an old man. The company of youngsters uh, is a little more inspiring. Apart from that, you are the future of this country. We are on the way out way out from the world itself. We have a long way to go. You will have an opportunity of shaping the destiny of this country, maybe for the next at least 50 years, if not more, 50, 60 years. The productive years perhaps will be 50. Uh, am I sufficiently audible?
No. I am not saying all this to please uh, the gathering here. If you have followed uh, the events of the last about a year and a half, and particularly the last uh, seven, eight months, I repeatedly say on various occasions that it is the younger generation which stood by me in whatever uh, adventure or misadventure I undertook as the judge of the Supreme Court. None of the, the big time uh, lawyers, the one crore red lawyers, not a, I think there are some 150 retired Supreme Court judges alive in this country, approximately. Num number may not be accurate, around. Nobody made a public statement uh, approving me. On the other hand, a couple of them made very uh, disapproving statements. It is the youngsters which supported me. Wherever I go, wherever I went in the last six months or wherever I go nowadays, to any part of this country, some youngster or other walks up to me and says something nice. That's personally very pleasing, I'm not on that. It indicates to me that the younger generation is watching the developments in this country. They are uh, mindful of the events, which is a very, uh, very heartening factor. It gives me hope that something good can happen to this country, if not during my lifetime, at least a little thereafter. When the invitation came, Mr. Akshay called me up maybe almost a couple of months back, or at least six, six weeks, sorry, six weeks or more, asking me to address this uh, gathering. I was a little surprised. I have received many invitations from law schools from all over the country. But Indian Institute of Technology, is, like many other people, I also believe that uh, the boys and girls in the Indian Institute of Technology are too busily engaged with science and uh, not, uh, not with the worldly matters. I remember to have read long back, I don't remember where I read it now, long back. It appears that when Israel was found, an offer was made to the greatest Jew available on that date, Albert Einstein, to become the first Prime Minister of Israel. I can't also say for this, I read it long back. I don't know where exactly I read it. He was supposed to have declined the offers, making a statement. I have spent many decades studying the nature of the universe, and I I believe today that I know something about it, but I must confess my utter ignorance of human affairs, therefore I'm unfit for this job, I declined it. The people who are busy with uh, science, science is nothing but pursuit of truth, may not uh, be very enthusiastic uh, to bother about the, the worldly affairs, the duplicity of the world, the chickenery, So, broadly, that's, uh, that's my understanding. So I was a little surprised when uh, the invitation came from the IIT Bombay, but I was happy that even serious students pursuing the study of sciences are also taking interest in the democratic governance of this country and the social uh, problems in this country. Because, as I was mentioning, I don't have to really, in a gathering of uh, students of technology, 
sciences or uh, more close to truth. Human sciences, social sciences are only illustrations of uh, human frailties. That's how I look at them. And if you read history, you will find what all kinds of atrocities went on uh, in the long history of uh, human race. What all wrong things happened. But nonetheless, human beings live on hope of a better tomorrow, better life. Better life for them, better life for their progeny, and so on and so forth. So therefore, effort goes on to find ways and means of uh, securing that better life. It's not an easy job. It's an eternal struggle. There's nothing like once you arrive at a conclusion, just as you arrive at a conclusion in mathematics, that it is true for all times to come, situation doesn't occur in uh, human affairs. In fact, in the constant assembly debates, Sardar Patel on a particular occasion made a statement. He said, uh, do you, I mean, he was addressing the constant assembly, the members of the constant assembly. He said, do you read history or have you stopped reading it ever since you have started making history? Because remember, all the members of the constant assembly were men and women who participated in great historic uh, events. So you stopped reading it ever since you have started making history. Patel adds, if later is the case, I must tell you, your future is very bleak. The study of history is very essential if you have to lay down the foundations for a better tomorrow. And only when we know what went wrong in the past, we can create, we can make an attempt to create a better tomorrow. The Constitution of India is a document whose uh, central purpose is to create a better tomorrow for Indians. If uh, apart from the various other arrangements of administration, governance and various things contained in the Constitution of India, There are two articles in the Constitution of India which indicate the entire purpose of the Constitution. They are in part four, the, what's called the directive principles of the Constitution. Article 38 says the state shall strive to promote The state shall strive to promote the welfare of the people by securing and protecting as effectively as it may a social order in which justice, social, economic and political shall inform all the institutions of the nation's life. This ultimately is the purpose of the constitution. Elaborating on this in Article 39, it said, the state shall in particular direct its policy towards securing that the citizens, men and women, equally have the right to an adequate means of livelihood, that the ownership and control of the material resources of the community are so distributed as best to subserve the common good, that the operation of the economic system does not result in concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment, so on and so forth. These articles, ultimately, in my opinion, they are the soul of the con. The entire exercise, the entire structure is built up for securing these values. Whatever other arrangements are there, if there's a parliament, if there's a legislative assembly, legislative council, the president of India, prime minister, the Supreme Court, judges, high court judges, all these people 
Finally, they exist for securing this. That's how I understood the constitution. And uh, after uh, some 46 years of the study of this subject, I have the audacity to believe that my understanding is not wrong. Now, what is this? Why are these things mentioned in the constitution? As I was mentioning, it was an assembly of uh, great men and women, constant assembly. It was an assembly of great men and women who knew the Indian society, who knew the Indian uh, history, who participated in the, most of them, participated in the freedom struggle. And when they were sure of establishing a republic and throwing off the foreign rule, they wanted to create a stable structure which would contain noble values for the future governance of this country. And the man in whose memory this lecture is being organized today is one of the central figures in the preparation of this document. I'm not talking about the physical sense that he was a member of the drafting committee, no. He was a member of the drafting committee, he was a member of uh, the assembly, he participated in the debate. Oh, these are all physical uh, facts, but the mind, the quality of the mind of that man. I am uh, a little pained. In this country, culturally, we have a problem. We have a tendency to deify everything without uh, rationally examining things. We want to create uh, deities. We want to create heroes. We want uh, worship. We very rarely as a class, I'm not talking about individuals, maybe students of IIT form a subclass, that's a different matter, I'm talking about the society in general. Rational analysis is generally a very, not a frequent uh, occurrence. We believe more in rhetoric. And in the Indian tradition, hyperbole plays a great role. If you study Indian literature in any language, Sanskrit, Telugu, Maharashtrian, Tamil, anything, Hyperbole plays a great role. So if, if there is a hero, his uh, chest must measure two square kilometers, and if the heroine, her eyes should look like uh, lotus uh, petals, this is all hyperbole. But the point is, in my view, we find Thousands and thousands of uh, statues of Baba Sahib all over the country. People uh, start worshipping and sometimes people start quarrelling, all kinds of uh, nonsensical things happen there. But the heart of the man, the mind of the man, what exactly he stood for, not many people try to understand. He is eventually sought to be identified with a limited group of people in this country, which I think is the greatest uh, dishonor we can do to that man. I don't want to go into the full details of what all he spoke in the, the volumes and volumes of Baba Sahib's uh, speeches published. The last time he addressed the constant assembly on the 25th November 1949, it is a speech which every one of you youngsters must read to understand what is the mind of the man. Apart from various other things, he cautioned the country about three pitfalls. He said, Eschew the grammar of anarchy. In so many words, Baba Sahib mentioned in this speech, 
this protests, satyagrahas and this kind of, this is grammar of anarchy. When we had no constitutional way of securing justice, all this was justified. Now that we have a government of our own, we have a constitution of our own, eschew this grammar of anarchy. Please read that speech, it's published. That's the first thing he said. Second thing is, do not lay your liberties at the feet of, because he quoted uh, from uh, J.S. Mill, do not lay your liberties at the feet of even a great man, man or woman, man includes woman in law. Because he was conscious of the Indian uh, culture and psyche that we are a nation of great hero worshippers. We see no fault in a, once a hero is created, afterwards we don't see anything wrong with that hero or heroine. The hero must be the epitome of all virtue and all good qualities. There can't be any bad quality in, in such a person. And once you reach that stage, you simply surrender to that person. You suspend your faculties of uh, logic and uh, rational thought. And this is the most fertile uh, ground for autocratic uh, governances and uh, governments. This kind of a surrender by the people, deifying somebody, creating heroes. He said, please don't do this. Third and most important, that's what I started with uh, reading to you, Article 38 and 39. Third and the most important thing he said on that day is that we, have, we are achieving political equality by securing independence and giving us a constitution. But this political independence will not survive, provided it is also coupled with social and economic equality. He was fully aware of the fact that Indian society is a society of graded inequalities. He says so. He was fully conscious of it. He says, unless we get rid of it, we make conscious effort to get rid of this great inequality in this country. This uh, political uh, freedom will not survive long. He says, I'm worried about it. I'm worried about it. How, how soon can we get about it? Please read this. It's a wonderful speech. If you want to understand India, if you want to understand the mind of Baba Sahib, read this one speech, because it was the grand finale. The last speech, last time he ever addressed that grand assembly, the legislative constant assembly of India. It contained the gist of his uh, whole thought process. Now, after all this, there's one famous uh, statement. There's a man called Joseph Story, one of those great American jurists. He wrote a commentary on American Constitution. <clears throat> the late Mr. Palkiwala from Bombay, he very frequently quoted this passage from story. After uh, praising the, in the context of the, the American Constitution, praising the arrangement and the beauty of the document created, story said, Nevertheless, the whole thing may perish within an hour of the folly of its own keepers, the people. No constitution, no arrangement can ensure you liberty or equality unless people are conscious of it, are ever vigilant about those liberties and the, the principles of the constitution. The minute you relax, it will vanish. In fact, on, some other, on one of those occasions in the constant assembly, Ambedkar said something to the same effect. It's a wonderful arrangement, we have arrived at. If this constitution fails, it fails not because there's something wrong with the constitution, but because mankind is vile, human beings are vile, therefore the thing fails. So that's the mind of the man. He understood the, clearly what's uh, possible in this country. What's possible with human nature? The superimposed uh, conditions of the Indian uh, historical background. So he cautioned the country. Now, this is 
I, re I understand that this forum is created inspired by the thought process of Ambedkar, Jyotra Phule, and Periyar uh, Ramaswam Nayaka. While uh, Periyar and uh, Phule chose social reform as a vehicle for the improvement of the society at large, and the and the lives of uh, the disadvantaged sections of the Indian society, Baba Sahib realized that unless the state power is structured in such a way, any amount of social reform by itself may not be able to achieve the result. It must necessarily be supported by the effort of the state for that an appropriate structure which would pave the way for reforming the society and securing social and economic justice is uh, required. Therefore, the entire constitution, though in theory, all the, in constitutional theory, all liberal democracies, whether it's the American democracy or Indian democracy or Canadian democracy, whatever it is, in theory, the first position is Constitutions are built on the principles of checks and balances. Nobody has absolute power. Nobody should be. Human mankind is not to be trusted with absolute power. Power is to be distributed. There must always be checks and balances in the uh, power structure. This is the first principle of constitutional law. Now, how it is achieved, sought to be achieved in different democracies is a different matter. Everybody has, every society made its own experiment. American democracy is different from the Indian democracy. You have uh, a system of uh, what we call the Westminster model, a political party securing large number of seats, forming the government and so on and so forth. It runs the government. The American democracy, the president is elected directly by the people. They're all democracies, but with different uh, forms. We adopted for historic reasons, we adopted the Western because of our own uh, historic background, our own engagement with the British, our own education system. In fact, uh, there was a phase in the Indian history in 1970s, an idea was floated, how about shifting to the presidential form of government, of course, it didn't uh, rectify, there was a lot of opposition. <clears throat> Now the point is, when the constitution was prepared, checks and balances were uh, created. The first thing is, there is a doctrine called the rule of law. There is an old American statement in one of the earliest judgments of the American Supreme Court. The constitution of, the government of America is not a government of men, but the government of laws. It's not the individuals who govern the country, but the laws govern the country. In other words, individual whims and fancies should not play any role in a democracy. There should be a law first. The law should be made by an appropriate legislative body. And legislative bodies consist of elected representatives of the people on whatever basis, adult franchise, universal adult franchise, or whatever it is. Fortunately, though we started late, we started with universal adult franchise. You take the Western Hemisphere till the Second World War, where all these democracies uh, took their uh, form. Till after the till after the First World War, women did not have the right to participate in the electoral process. It was an evolution. It takes it took time. We started out at a slightly better uh, starting point in 1950 to start with both men and women of a particular age were recognized to have the right to participate in the electoral process. Because the participation of uh, people in the governing governance of this country is the first check on the abuse of the power. Pandit Nehru on a particular occasion dealing with the, with the, the Supreme Court judgments and Supreme Court struck down one of those uh, enactments. He said, I would rather trust the 
decision of 30 million, sorry, 300 millions of, uh, that was the number at that point of time, 300 millions of uh, illiterate people, then the wisdom of uh, nine uh, judges, he said. Because that, that huge mass has a great potential to arrive perhaps at the right conclusion on any question. They have a innate sense, they, they smell what is right and what is wrong. If you have, all youngsters, I don't know how many of you have studied the last history, the history of India for the last 50 years. One thing that happened in this country, which makes all of us hope that something is going to happen further, is whenever an election took place, the common man unequivocally declared his faith in somebody. His choice need not have always been right. But when he wanted to reject somebody, the most mighty were met to bite dust. People who were thought invincible just went off in one election. You can check up the history. People who had huge personal charisma, they lost elections. So that common man doesn't lose the... It is on the other hand, well, uh, late Mr. Ramano Harlohia, I believe, used to very often uh, quip, it is the English knowing gentleman of this country who betray this country. The common man who doesn't know English, his uh, ears are more close to the ground and he knows what is good for him, what is not good for him. What is good for him is good for the country. What is good for me or what is good for a big industrialist may not be good for uh, most of the masses of this country. They know it better, what is good for them. So they take a wise decision. So therefore, this elected represent they choose the representatives. Whenever they don't want a particular set of people to govern them, don't want them to have any role in the lawmaking, they simply ask them to get out. That is the first check. What happened to that check, I'll come to a little later. The second check is, once a government is elected, once the legislatures are constituted after the election, Governments are established by those who control the majority in the legislative bodies. They are made answerable to whatever they do to the legislative body of, of which they are members. If a decision is taken, a law is made, it can only be made with the concurrence of the majority of the members of that legislative body which they represent. That is the second check. How effectively that check is being exercised in the last 70 years is another story. We'll deal with it a little later. The third type of check is the judicial review. When a law is made or when a law is implemented, there is always a possibility. Majorities need not always decide uh, wisely. We have, we have been watching. There is something called mass hysteria. Sometimes people get into the frenzy. If majorities are the only consideration for determining what is right and what is wrong, Hitler was right because he came with a great majority, he came with a thumping majority to power, the Third Reich. But then you know what happened thereafter. So therefore, human nature and the potential of the human nature to abuse authority when it is where it is supported by huge following, is the very foundation of the constitution. It must, there are certain values which are inviolable. You can never violate, you can never make any law. You may have all the 573 seats in the parliament in favor of one particular political party, but there are certain values which can't be violated by all of them collective, even 573 collective, all of them vote together. See, for example, a man's life, the Article 21 says, no person shall be deprived of his life save by authority of law. The entire parliament, both the houses, all the members put together unanimously can't decide, all right, we don't want a law, we'll simply hang so and so. It's not possible. Because the majorities can, al can also err. In fact, one great example always given is, all of you, students of science, must have heard the name of uh, 
Socrates and how he died. Can somebody tell me how he died? He was quite Ah, Hemlock. He was administered to Hemlock. And uh, why was it? The entire city of Athens, it was not uh, XYZ judges, Chalameshwar or XYZ judges who determined the man is guilty and must be killed. The entire city of Athens gathered, adjured him guilty. He was supposed to be propagating dangerous ideas. So therefore they thought the man should not uh, continue in the society, he must be killed. Eventually he was administered poison, hemlock. Now, it is the most democratic decision, but going by the numbers. <laughs> going by the numbers. When a judge of the Supreme Court or two judges or three judges decide, at least numbers are not in their favor. They decide to hang somebody. I don't know how democratic it is, but certainly numbers are not in their favor. But in the case of Socrates, the numbers were in favor of the verdict. The entire city of Athens gathered. But question is, a democracy is required not only to be majoritarian, but it should also be liberal. It was be informed with certain liberal values. That's the structure of uh, the constitutions, whether it is the Indian constitution or the American constitution. There are certain values which are believed to be inviolable, no matter whatever is the majority of the government in the parliament or the state legislative assembly. You don't cross this line. If you arrest a man, the constitution says, for whatever reason, Produce him before a magistrate as early as possible, at any rate not later than 24 hours. You know the reason why? You're all nice people studying in a wonderful campus, protected atmosphere. If somebody is arrested and is not produced within 24, as early as possible, in the police station what can happen? I don't know how many of you are aware. If you watch movies, some of the movies portray what happens there. So to avoid that possibility, to fix the responsibility, the minute a person arrested is produced before the magistrate, the responsibility is fixed. So-and-so is, is in custody of so-and-so police station. If afterwards something happens to that man in custody, the police officer in charge of the station would be held responsible. That is the purpose of the constitution, which declares that it must be produced as early as possible. Tomorrow, if uh, the parliament decides, all right, no, 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 why should all these uh, criminals be given such a benefit, let them... Uh, Languish in the jail for a week before they are produced, often it will violate the constitution. There yeah, are some of these things which are considered so sacred, so fundamental to human liberty and human life. These are the values which are established or enshrined in the constitution. Now, all this was done with a great vision, with a great understanding of human nature, with a great understanding of human history. And all those tragedies which took place in, uh, say for example, Socrates. So there must be a charge, and the charge must be an independent charge, capable of being independently verified. You can't simply gather, all of us can't uh, gather and say, look here, hang this man. There's no law. Maybe all of us are of the same opinion. But then you must give reasons first. First of all, what is the offense the man has committed or woman has committed? And uh, what is the law which requires the person to be hung? You know, there's a big process uh, created by the constitutional structure. These are certain values without which none of us is safe. Sometimes when a ghastly incident takes place, the society generally becomes very impatient. No, 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 the courts, I'm not justifying the long delays in the courts, I'm not on that point. No, 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 courts take a uh, long time when courts uh, equip people. The point is, if there is no proper evidence, courts have no alternative. If, if that's not the case, the danger is this. Anybody in power, anybody in power can fix any one of us. Next morning, the policeman comes and says, this Chalameshwar is a murderer, he killed so yesterday, went to Bombay, killed somebody there. Afterwards, there's no way I can get out of it. It can happen to any one of you. To avoid that possibility, these principles are incorporated in the Constitution. Now, broadly, that's the arrangement. Now, in the last 70 years, 
how faithfully have we implemented uh, the constitution is a question. There have been a number of violations of the constitution. Well, uh, a one-hour speech may not be sufficient to explain all those things. You uh, to read the newspapers, you read the history, you will find a lot of these things. When we talk about the first check being the lawmakers, the, list, the periodically elected uh, representatives of the people is the first check in a democracy, how we have uh, subverted that check, all of us know, just about a year and a half back, in a small gathering, I was present, uh, consisting of some 50, 60 people, or each one of them held some very responsible position in the governance of this country at some point of time or the other. One of them was a gentleman called Mr. Brahma. He was a one-time uh, Election Commission of India. He was from northeastern states. He belonged to the Andhra Pradesh cadre. Eventually, he became the Election Commissioner. A man who had first hand knowledge of the electoral process in this country. All of us know to some extent. But he had the authority, he had uh, to supervise the electoral process in this country. Starting from the President of India's election to the Legislative Assembly election of the smallest state in this country. So, Brahma made a very profound statement, which most of us, you go out and you talk to your cousins in the village or in the Bombay city somewhere, they'll also say this. Anyway, I'll ask you, my dear friends, uh, how much does it cost roughly for somebody to become a member of the Legislative Assembly in Maharashtra? Any idea? Oh, don't worry, I think it's a closed door, nobody's going to do anything to us. Any idea? Just two crores. You are very fine people. Maharashtrians are very fine people, if, they, if that is the case. In, uh, in my parent state, Andhra Pradesh, the estimate is about 10 to 15 crores. And somebody to become a member of the parliament, it costs 40, 50 crores. And, well, okay, I'm not a very honorable man because, you know, I hold press conferences, talk something against everybody. <laughs> But Brahma was an honorable man, he never held a press conference. In a closed door meeting, he said it. He said it. They are spending about 50 crores to become members of the parliament. When he completed that statement, all the 50, 60 members gathered there, started smiling, uh, laughing. That is the tragedy. It's too serious a matter. The first check is failing. If somebody is spending 50 crores to become a member of the parliament, what do you expect him to do thereafter? Do you expect him to strictly implement the constitution? First, he'll have to recover his money. If he is a very honorable man, he'll recover the money. He will not take the money and build estates. He'll recover the money and make some more money to get ready for the next election. Afterwards, where is the constitution? What are the, where are the values? How will he be able to implement them? So in the 70 years, this is what we have achieved in this country. I'm not blaming any individuals, all political parties in some degree or the other are responsible for it. And all of us are in some way or the other responsible for the entire Indian population. But how to deal with it is the question. How to create that awareness is the question. And since the topic is 70 years of the working of the Indian constitution, I have to mention this. Then, the second thing is, the answerability of the members of the government to the legislative body. If X minister in a particular state or the government of India does something wrong, the legislative body has the authority to haul him up and find out why did he do this wrong thing, why did he do this illegal thing. And then, uh, in an ideal situation where the system is functioning well, once it is, uh, once such a thing happens, such a person would cease to be a minister. But very rarely, 
it's happening in this country that uh, after doing all these things, people continue to be ministers. Parliament and legislative assembly who are very eager to assert that they are, uh, they are the ultimate representatives of the people, they are assertions of sovereignty, that they are sovereign. Of course, legally it's a doubtful concept whether parliament is sovereign or people are sovereign. Let's not go into that. Who are very eager to assert that, they hardly take note of it. And because once again, the party loyalties come. Actually, Ambedkar says it. If you start putting your party creed above, above the nation, the system will fail, he says. Nobody took note of it. Nobody respected it. Everybody, of course, on the Ambedkar Jayanti, all political parties, all leaders of every uh, color, hue, all communities go and say, Baba Sahib is a great man, but it is a lip service. The ultimate respect which we can show to any human being, not only Baba Sahib, is to follow what the other person, if the man is saying something good, is to follow what the other man is saying. That is the real respect. Simply putting a garland and praising on a particular day is no respect. This, but then there is a very difficult situation in this country, as I was mentioning, this hero worship is a problem in this country. All of you must have noticed, when a particular chief minister of a particular state in this country was found guilty of corruption, the chief minister, had, I'm avoiding the name, the chief minister had to step down from the office temporarily because of the finding of the court. Consequentially, there was a by-election. And the candidate fielded by that political party headed by that particular chief minister, one with a unheard of majority of some five, six lakh majority. So there's a problem. This is the Indian society. This is the Indian people. This is the Indian psyche of hero worship. We see no faults in somebody whom we start admiring and adoring. Afterwards, whatever they do is right. Even if it is established, the person has done something wrong, we don't care for it. Our leader is always right, is our belief. Well, it's strictly not democracy. In fact, in 2013, first time I went to US. Uh, I went around and I was in New York for a few days. A few friends gathered people of Indian origin, few friends gathered. We were just having some... Yeah. Incidentally, one of them was mentioning that three former governors of the New York state were in jail on charges of corruption. The difference in the maturity of the democracy is that in a little more mature democracy is the law catches up with the lawbreakers at some point of time or the other. Well, here it takes, you know, why does it happen? Well, it's a great analysis, as I told you. In one hour, I can't uh, go into these things. And the third check of judicial review and judicial control on all these things is also showing uh, aberrations. I don't say it's totally failed, but certainly it is showing aberrations. This is what we have come to in the last seven. I don't say we have achieved it, it happened. And I only hope it's a passing phase because as a student of history, I'm conscious of the fact that each one of these maladies which we see or experience today were experienced by the so-called great democracies of the world. If you study the American history, whatever we see today, happened at some point of time earlier in this country. Whatever uh, we see today, the spending of 30 crores, 40 crores. In Britain, before the parliamentary reform of 1830s, people were purchasing their seats in the parliament, officially. They acquire a borough, and then that entitles them to become a member of the parliament. So all these things happened. Then, for a period of time, those societies matured democratically got rid of some of these, uh, if not all, some of these bad practices. They are showing a greater degree of maturity. Well, let us also hope at some time in future, this Indian society also. I told you, the only thing which makes me believe that there is a hope 
is the maturity which the Indian electorate shows periodically at the time of election, throwing out people. So, so long as that is there, there is a hope. Something may happen sometime later, if not today, 10 years, 20 years later. I may not see, but you people will see it. You, perhaps you will uh, you will be responsible bringing about that change. You make that effort, study science. But at the same time, take some interest in the affairs, public affairs of this country, because unless you are you are you are in the queue before the American embassy to get it open, it's also you are not very welcome there. Trump doesn't want most of us there. The chance of going there also is not much there. You'll have to live in this country. And if you want to live in this country, you have to live in this country, whether you want it or not. You better know something about this, what's happening in this country, what is good. Because I don't want you to go and have a sh cultural shock once you get out of the area because they're all protected uh, areas, campus, university campuses. And the life beyond the campus, what you people use. I know each, I was a student, I was in a campus. We had our own problems. But the problems which you face here today are very trivial compared to the problems you may have to face once you walk out of the gates of the Bombay AIT. Be prepared for that. If preparation is only by understanding what's going on and also taking an active interest in public affairs when things go wrong, raise the voice. As I was pointing out, as Baba Sahib said, don't resort to anarchy. There are ways of protesting democratically. The one good thing today is the modern technology has gifted us is internet. With one click you can communicate with the whole world. In fact, I remember that man, was it? Thomas Friedman. He wrote in one of uh, his books, he says, everybody is connected, nobody is in control, nobody can stop anybody there. In fact, in the 19th century, when a wars, lot of wars took place, a lot of occupations took place, the conquering armies, the, one of the first acts of a conquering army was to capture the local radio station, cut off the communication, take control of the communication system. This doesn't work in the 21st century because uh, we don't need uh, radio. Anybody with a smartphone which costs three, four thousand rupees, you can communicate with anybody in this world. So that's one advantage. You can always uh, register your protest with and uh, give your opinion. Inform your uh, fellow citizens in this country, look here, things are going wrong, please uh, raise your voice. As Baba Sahib said, don't go by the grammar of anarchy, go to the road of pelt stones on the buses. This is all not good, not good for us. Ultimately, we'll have to travel by the bus. All those big people will go by private uh, aircrafts and helicopters. Only we'll go by those buses. Don't, don't touch them. But there are other ways, civilized ways and more democratic ways and with technology it is possible to raise this. Please take interest in that. My dear friends, I think I uh, have already exceeded the time. I will be happy to answer questions for some time. And at the end of my so-called speech, if you call it a speech, I express my deep gratitude to each one of you for giving me such great attention and uh, hearing me with patience. Thank you all. First question is there is a lot of quid pro quo in all the courts from lower court to the Supreme Court. What do you, how do you define quid pro quo? First you define it, then I'll tell you whether you're right or not. Yes, sir. Something for something. If the judges who are sitting in the position to deliver the justice, if they will be offered either money or any further position, immediately they are suppressing the victims and doing favor to some people. This is called quid pro quo. So everywhere, from lower court to the Supreme Court, it's happening. Do we have any policy or idea how to overcome from this big problem? Because the judicial system is the only thing which can protect the rights of all the citizens and can implement the Constitution. This is the first question.
one second, one second. Let me let me de deal with it. Then we'll come to the other questions. See that at every level there is a quid pro quo. Judges decide cases only for ulterior reasons. Is too sweeping a statement. If really that were to be the truth. You and I will not be able to sit like this and uh, deliberate so comfortably. There is still some semblance of a law and order in this country and some semblance of a rule of law in this country. Now, how wonderful it is a different matter. We open the newspaper every morning, we see what are, what are all the wrong things happening. But at the same time to say that in every case, every judge is only operating on this quid pro quo basis, is too sweeping a statement, uh, I, I beg to disagree with you there. Now. There have been instances where uh, in some of the matters wrong things have happened. Now, you are asking me what to do. So, gentlemen, that is the big problem. See, all democratic debate becomes perverted in the hands of Western interests. I don't know how many of you have followed that uh, episode of that uh, medical colleges scandal which took place about a year back, about a year and a half back roughly, a year back, not even a year and a half now. A former chief justice of a particular state was arrested by CBI on an allegation that this man was trying to corrupt the Supreme Court judges in some cases. And mind you, I didn't uh, lodge the complaint. CBA independently arrested the man before any one of us knew about it. CBA knew it. They arrested him. And after the arrest, of course the man was bailed out. Then somebody filed a public interest litigation saying that look here, there is a case like this. If it is true, it is a disaster for this country. If the Supreme Court judges could be manipulated this way. If it is not true, it is equally necessary to probe into the matter and see why it is happening, why this kind of a propaganda is going on. Either which way this matter is required to be examined by the court. That was the petition. Since there was an allegation in that uh, case that the then Chief Justice of India's name was involved in this whole uh, process. A mention was made before. The other technicalities, I don't want to go into all these things since I'm only trying to answer. All that I said is, look here, it's too serious a matter for this country and this institution let this matter be heard by the first five judges of this country. Let it be examined. Then all hell broke loose and you know what all had happened. No, I'm not really worried about what all happened. I get my pension, gentlemen. I'm still getting my pension. I have reached that stage. I simply stopped bothering about it. And there are great lawyers and great judges in this country who believe eventually all this led to the press conference. So many things like this. And there are a lot of people who believe that I have an agenda behind it. What is the agenda? I want to grab the office. There's not that man and no. Wonderful. If that's your understanding, be happy with the system. I have nothing to lose. I take my pension, go home. No. But it does not mean that the entire system is like this. If the entire system were to be like this, you know, this kind of a meeting is not possible. Not mm. No, that's what, that's what I'm saying. The things, yes, yes. No, no, no. The point is this. When these things are going on, I don't know how many of you have followed this uh, event and the aftermath of it. There's a huge amount of material on the internet. A lot of youngsters published a lot of articles. Brilliant people, brilliant analysis. Information, but the part, no, I only wish more number of people participated, if, if only more, see, don't take, I'm not saying go take to the streets. If, if public pressure builds, 
governments will buckle, any government. What happened to a Maharashtra Kisan rally? They didn't resort to any violence. They simply marched. The minute the government realized that the public pressure is building, governments are, people running the governments are very wise, they know next election is going to be troublesome for them. They immediately fall in line. Now, in a matter like this, most of the people, uh, maybe since they are not aware of the nuances of the legal process, or most of the people, some of the people are, uh, some of a holy fear is created, and anything about judiciary is contempt, therefore don't open your mouth. All right, contempt, you want to go to jail? Uh, the father of the nation went to jail for us. Can't we go to jail for a couple of days if we, if we believe that we are fighting for a right cause? It is the public opinion that matters. That is the only solution I can offer to you. There is another question. Can we avoid the names, gentlemen? Can we, can we avoid names? It may not be very. Oh, okay. oh, all right. Because I want to take there are two issues. Yes, tell me. Uh, so, in the same way, you were protest. It was the first protest in Indian history that four senior most judges have come in front of media and accepted. The thing which CS Colonel, CS Colonel has done. The same thing I feel in my understanding, you are four character. Hmm? You four people, hmm. four judges have done. Hmm. Then what's the mistake this is Kannan has committed that you have not committed? And he was sentenced to the jail and you people are freely moving outside. You want me to go to jail? Ready? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Have you read my judgment in Karnan's case? Have you read my judgment in Karnan's case? Don't go by the newspaper's judgment. That is the whole difficulty. No, no, I'm that's, not, no that's, not, that's, that's, why, that's why I'm asking you. Did you read the judgment? You didn't read. You read my judgment. I never found Karnan guilty of finding fault with a. See, what was the contempt case drawn against him? Uh, I have first page, five pages. It was 80 pages uh, no, 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 mine is, mine, no, mine is very short. Not, mine is not that long. Mine is just about uh, seven, eight pages. All right, now that that question is raised, I must answer it. What was the contempt case against Karnam? This man went on accusing almost everybody in the Madras High Court, some of the judges of the Supreme Court. He made all kinds of allegations that they are corrupt, some of them are humanizers, whatever allegations are made. Now, the, the then Chief Justice of India, in his wisdom, thought that contempt proceedings ought to be initiated against this man. Since it was a High Court judge, and it is an unprecedented thing, the first seven judges of the Supreme Court were asked to participate in the bench. I was one of the seven. And please read my judgment. I never, in fact I said, whether the allegations made by Karnan would amount to contempt or not, I am not deciding. Suppose if he believes, Karnan believes Chalameshwar is corrupt, he writes to the President of India or Prime Minister of India saying that this man is corrupt. I don't think by any standard it can be said because whom else will he complain to if he believes he is, no, whether he will be able to prove or not is a different question. No, but what I wrote is his post notice conduct, he defied the court, he refused to participate, so notice is issued, we are following a system, now it is open for him to come and participate, look here I am right, I have information therefore I complain. I don't know how the court would have reacted, he refused to participate in the debate, on the other hand, he started passing orders, sitting in the high court, saying that all these judges are, uh, can't proceed with the case, X, Y, Z. In fact, for information, you know something, September I went out of retirement for a month, I just wanted to get out of this, uh, you know, all these pressures, I wanted a break. I went to UK, for three, four weeks I was there. This gentleman sent a petition to somebody, I think uh, International Court of Justice. I already condemned Justice Chalamashwar. 
he is a he is a fugitive offender. Please uh, apprehend him and bring him back to. See, the point is the man is a little imbalanced. Man is imbalanced. His earlier conduct, but then when you when the court issues notice, you must come and say something. Whether I stand by my statement, I don't know. We'll examine whether he is justified or not. If or I don't stand by I made a mistake, I'm sorry. There are ways of dealing with it. He said in the Madras High Court, started passing orders parallelly. In the system of hierarchy, that is not permissible in law. When the highest court is dealing with the matter, if another court starts saying that, no, you can't hear the matter, I'll uh, haul you up for contempt, that, that part of it is contempt. That's what happened. That is the difference. If you still believe that I did wrong, well, send me to jail, I'll go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, please, please. Uh, the purpose of Indian constitution is to bring the equality to the society. Sorry, sorry. The purpose of Indian constitution and the system. Yes, that's what the text of the constitution says. Is to bring equality in the system. Yesterday evening, yesterday, yesterday evening, there was a judgment or SP, SP, OBC quotas in implementation. Judgment, I'll, see, I'll tell you first two things. I'll tell you two things. First of all, the law as it stands in this country today, the reservations in employment and government employment is a part of the policy choice of the government. Constitution doesn't say give couples only 30% or 40% reservation to have XYZ community, any community. It doesn't say that. Constitution only says it is open to the in substance. It says it is open for the state to make special provisions to protect the interests of uh, socially and educationally backward classes. The only positive reservation provided by the constitution is representation in the legislative bodies, parliament. The constitution is specific. Seats must be reserved in the parliament. Seats must be reserved in the legislative assembly. This is the constitutional mandate. Now, insofar as jobs and uh, educational opportunities are concerned, constitution doesn't mandate give to couples and lead to couples to put it say. It leaves it to the state, depending upon the state's assessment of the need and other things, fix a certain number of uh, posts and opportunities, educational opportunities to be reserved. Now, I don't know what exactly was the rule imposed in that particular state. Unless I study the judgment, I can't give it. Let's be liberal. We are demonstrating a majority. Then also, this is the last question. Let us complete it. Yes. Uh, excuse me. Mr. Shivakanda, let others give the chance. We will have discussion outside. Please. No, 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 please. I said one minute. So, this is the question. Okay. I will talk to you later. I will give you the chance. Being a legal protector. Hello. Being a legal protector. How can you go and participate or inaugurate a statue of a person? Me? Hmm? Whose statue did I inaugurate? Whose statue? Karamchen, your city. No, whose who statue did I inaugurate? Chinchurame. No, I know what to repeat. No, I know you personally. I know what to repeat so very intimately. Yeah. I know what to pursue your facts are wrong. Okay. The facts are wrong. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Sir. Yes. Hello, a request. Please ask only one question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Chandra, sir. Uh, thanks for the talk. I happened to visit your talk in Hyderabad. Mantan Samad was also in Gandhi Jayanti also. Here is my question on the SCSC uh, atrocities part. You know, the recent uh, two bench two, two judge uh, verdict. So, so, I mean, uh, uh, they, they stated that this, this was misuse uh, and should not arrest the victim that, uh, in regard to the government uh, employees uh, to safeguard or protect the victim. 
And they also stated this uh, without any substantial report, but uh, national crime record uh, data, which has equitable rate of 700 percent for uh, some other, I mean, there are many reasons uh, included in it. But my question is, uh, here in the preamble, when we have this equality, justice, and the liberty, uh, and of course the constitution justifies policies, laws, and programs to the weaker section. Sorry, sir, last sentence repeat. The constitution justifies laws, policies, and programs to the weaker sections. Which means liberty is not absolute to the SCSTs, but it is tailored to the circumstances. Okay, but when these kind of issues like dilution of SCSTs Act is are happening against the Dalit, and recently, you know, uh, which was happened in Karnataka, so where the almost many villages face the so called the discrimination and untouchability, so the dilution of SCSTs, uh, SCST atrocities act, so in, 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 in uh, in a way, how we have to interpret in terms of liberty? This is my question. See, if I remember right, the review is coming on the judgment. The judgment which you are referring to, I think a review obligation is pending before the Supreme Court on that. Just let us see what happens with the review. See, the opinion of, there is one thing, apart from this case, there is a structural function in the Supreme Court. There is the highest court of the country. You take the American Supreme Court, they have decided limited number of cases every year. There is about 120, 130 cases they decide. Unlike the Indian Supreme Court, we decide thousands of cases. And every year they come up with five. Now, when those 120 cases are decided by the American Supreme Court, all the nine judges of the Supreme Court sit in back and decide the fact. In addition, the immigration is not even there to the judgment to have uh, sometimes uh, controversy. There's nothing absolute in these matters. And the opinion which is held today, 10 years later, might be found to be uh, unacceptable. We see a lot of this thing. But in the Indian Supreme Court, this problem of delusion ventures, two judges sit there decide. Another two judges, depending upon their own understanding of the Constitution, their own uh, political philosophy, they may come to a different conclusion. And this is a structural problem essentially. Other than that, since the judgment is pending review at this stage, let us leave it there, let us see what happens. So that will take place. Maybe they will reconsider it. Yes. Ms. Wilkinson, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the word reservation by the constitution of. Keep the mic slightly a bit. I'm not over here. Reservation, the word reservation by the constitution of India and by the Dr. Babasai Kamaluka is to provide social, economical, and educational. Can you come a bit closer? I'll just move the mic slightly. So, uh, the word is written by the Constitution of India and by Dr. Dawasar Pankar is to provide social, economic, education and other equalities towards the backward class and backward class. I think I may have a request you to come closer and not over here. Please come. Please come. Until then, can I ask one question? Sorry, sorry. One question. I can complete. Don't use the mic. Keep it closer. Keep it closer. Yes, please, sir. Yeah, I'm going to. So, uh, the word reservation by the Constitution of India and by Dr. Bhavasa and America is to provide social, economical, education, and other equalities towards the backward people of the society. Whether giving any person reservation for economically weak. Uh, to a particular category uh, is the proper way to think of the better tomorrow for the nation? No. Oh. <laughs> you are putting me to different by asking questions which say, you know, they have retired and more difficulty in France. <laughs> See, one problem is the text of the constitution only enables the legislature, parliament or the state legislature 
to make these reservations for socially and educationally backward uh, segments of the society, not economically weaker sections. That's not the text if you read the constitution. Now, to what extent uh, the, the current program would be sustained in the court, I don't know. How the, how the Supreme Court is going to deal with it, I don't know. But I can tell you this much, that economically weaker uh, segments is not part of the text of the constitution. That's all I can say. It's a political decision. Can it be scrapped or not? Is a political decision. It's for the elected bodies to decide. If a law is made, whether the law should continue or it should be scrapped, is for the same law-making body to determine whether it's constitutionally permissible or not. The court has already decided it's permissible. And all these laws were tested. Now, whether that, those judgments are to our liking or not is a different matter. It's a different matter. But that is the law until reversed. I'll, uh, I'll tell you, there's a famous uh, constitutional, professor, constitutional professor, a man called Lawrence Tribe. He teaches uh, constitutional in Harvard University. He wrote a wonderful treatise on American constitutional law. In his, in his uh, preface, he says, I do not consider the judgments of the Supreme Court, of course, he was talking about the American Supreme Court, I do not consider the judgments of the Supreme Court to be synonymous with constitutional truth. A court which held slaves to be non-persons, if you study the American history, there was a case of uh, 1850s, there was a called Dred Scott's case. Dred Scott was a black, he was a black African who was, you know, the slavery was in vogue. He was in one of those states, somebody purchased him as a slave, and somehow he, he traveled to another state where slavery was abolished. Then he declared, look here, now in this state slavery is abolished, therefore I'm a free man, I sh it should be this thing. Then the American Supreme Court said, no, 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 all these rights are in substance, whatever language is, in substance, all these rights, rights of equality are available only to uh, non, uh, available only to the whites. So, but now today that is not the position, a hundred years later, the American Supreme Court revised its opinion. In that context, works, I mean, this tribe says, a court which held slaves to be non-persons, separate is equal, till 1950s in US, what we consider to be a great democracy today, the US maintained separate schools for black children, separate uh, restaurants for uh, blacks, separate beaches for blacks, all these things went on till 1950s until eventually the Supreme Court in uh, Brown's case said this is all discrimination, it can't continue. Till then on more than one occasion the challenges were repelled. So commenting on that tribe says, a court which held slaves to be non-person and separate is equal could either hardly be final or infallible. But the scholarship of the man comes in the next statement. But such passing finality as the judgments of the Supreme Court have, is essentially a compromise between order and chaos. Somebody has to decide. In the system which we have chosen, we have chosen the Supreme Court to be the final arbitrator. In a particular case, the Supreme Court may give a wrong judgment, which will be think wrong. Maybe 10 years later, the Supreme Court may revise its opinion. So your liberty to question the correctness of the judgment can't be denied. But to say that the Supreme Court uh, can't give that, I mean, there's no way you can stop it. It has the authority to give the judgment. Well, continue to reiterate the matter. What I mean to say is these two laws are, uh, these two laws are almost uh, draconian laws that of our... That's your opinion. Fair enough, gentlemen, that's your opinion. Maybe I also believe in it. But then the majority of the members of the parliament don't agree with it. And the Supreme Court has not agreed with this submission. Supreme Court has not agreed with that submission. What do we do? 
Where do we go? See, some of these things are finally matters of opinion. Now, individually, in a particular case, whether a particular person can be held to be guilty of sedition or not is a different question altogether. Whether such a law should exist or not is a larger question. Well, the, the elected representatives, or those are the representatives whom we have chosen. They decided so. And then the court approved it. Whether it should have done it or not is a matter of, all right, I say no, but what happens thereafter? That's still continues to be the judgment. At least till yesterday, my judgment uh, would have some effect. Today, I'm a retired man, whatever opinion I hold is as good or as bad as your opinion. Yes. Very good, sir. I would like to mention here that you are not only speech, but your judgments are massive and substantial, sir. Uh -huh. Your all judgments uh -huh. and your speech is massive and substantial, sir. Massive and substantial. Not massive. <laughs> I never wrote long judgments, gentlemen. <laughs> well, whether they are substantive or not, uh, is a. Hello, sir. Uh -huh. and my question is that. Uh, National Judicial Appointment Commission, uh, which has been uh, declared unconstitutional by Supreme Court, American Supreme Court, was not this uh, act uh, the golden opportunity to bring the uh, transparency in the judiciary? Bring the transparency in the judiciary. That's, that's what I attempted, gentlemen. It's all right, it's history now. The Supreme Court declared the act to be unconstitutional. No, the question is, even if it is to be, we, we accept the judgment as it is. We take the collegium only can determine. Question is, how should the collegium determine is the further question. Should there be some transparency? You, do you record some reasons? Why do you say a particular man is suitable? Why do you say a particular uh, woman is uh, not suitable? Why, why is a particular judge being transferred? Why is a particular judge not being... Please record some reasons. That's all I said when I said there is no transparency in the matter. Would have been better to accept some provisions in this act instead of declare all why are you telling me? I was a dissenting judge. Go and tell the majority judges. <laughs> you are addressing the wrong person, gentlemen. Sir, I told Kata in Indian region, uh, most of the regions are from the community that is uh, SCHC and Muslim. Uh, so, come again. Uh, sir, sir, uh, I call Tata, uh, in Indian prison. Am I right, sir? Indian prison. Prison, no. Indian prison, prison. 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 Ah. prison. Ah. prison. so there are communities from SCHC and Muslim background, so they represent more, more numbers in Indian prison. So, but it doesn't mean that uh, they are criminal. This because that they don't have money to hire a lawyer for their case. And so, in this case, how do you see uh, this type of incidents happening with the Muslim SCHC and uh, they are becoming a criminal within the Jewish, uh, like the Indian region. And uh, by the, uh, by delivering, delivering judgment, how could one judge ensure that there is no personal biases while delivering judgment in regards to SCHC Muslim being not a member from this community? So, and then second would be linked to this question. So, what should be done? to give representation to the SCSC Muslim community in the Indian judiciary. Uh, as like uh, the more representation of this community so that they can at least uh, justify the cases of SCSC and Muslim. Now the first question about the results. Statistically, I have not checked up. I am taking from you that uh, uh, we are the inmates of these prisons belong to this this particular uh, categories of people. I take it from you. It's possible, probable also. Now, <coughs> the only way to handle this problem is provide better legal service to these people. And personally, 
little bit of a grind. For the long we have in this country, the person has to try it. Evidence in the record will be produced. If a person does not get proper legal assistance, he may not be able to establish that he is innocent. Question is that the problem in legal assistance is required to be produced and uh, given to that man. I don't know. Now, the two ways is that the voluntary organizations can undertake it or the state will undertake it. And then uh, you know, in this country, anything undertaken by the state, the efficiency levels generally are not very encouraged. So the better course is to promote the voluntary organizations to assist the students. That's one thing. The second question was that uh, mm, Ah, representation of Whether it is for the reform, judicial reform, how to choose people from this uh, bodies. Uh, unfortunately, nobody is just nobody is talking about the reform. How much of representation is required? But there is uh, first of all, do we choose people to the judiciary on the basis of communal representation or not the first question. If they have to be chosen, what is the mechanism by which they have to be chosen? Then all this requires a debate. Nobody is willing to debate it in this country. Everybody talks about it. Makes a demonstration and then you would there. In fact, I have the chiefness of two reports. Periodically, the law minister uh, writes to the chief justice. There's only vacancies in your high court. Please take steps to fill up these uh, positions. And also, kindly keep the claims of the so and so, so and so segments of the society women, minorities, SCSP, so on and so on. Now, it's a decision to choose these people with the decision of the college and not one individual. The chief justice and next two. Now all of them I must agree upon an individual, whether it's that individual be of a particular uh, segment, the whatever it is. That unanimity, that is one thing. You can't compel them, any one of them. The things you do not agree, they not sign. Now, if really representation is to be given only on the communal basis, then there is only one of them that will the law. Then you must address the lawmakers to do that. This half hearted measures will not work. Writing letters will not work. Yes, sir. Yes.
principles should examine the judgments more uh, intensely. Going by the newspaper reports and the facts, the lady said, Does it woman, what reason she gave? Did you examine the reasons given by her? Did you see them? Did you see the reasons given aside by the dissenting head, the lady? Did you read the reasons? Sorry? The legitimacy of any code mm. lies in the confidence that people have in them. Uh, Last year, when you took to the media to dissent various things happening in the Supreme Court, have you ever thought that it may lead to the danger of people losing confidence in the Supreme Court or any other court for that sense? Yes, I, I did think of it. I believe in wrongdoing some not stop. See, if people lose confidence in the institutions, it's not good. But if wrong things happen, it's also not good for the institution in the long run, the institution will be destroyed. So the question is one of the way in which according to me is right. But I think that, that uh, I, I believe that the, the matter is brought to the notice of the country. I don't know. I have my Contemporary opinions are always covered by their own likes and dislikes, prejudices and preferences. Let us see what happens. I certainly thought of all these things. You can't blame me for not thinking over these things. You may not agree with me, that's a different matter. So, uh, this will be the last question for the session. Hello. Uh, sir, as a personal decision, uh, you decided that. Uh, after, after your retirement, you won't take any uh, governmental positions. As a person, this decision, you took that decision. No, I'm As a person, you took that decision. You took a decision that you won't take any governmental positions yes. after your retirement. Yes. Don't you think this should be the, uh, 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 by law, uh, none of the judges should be taking any governmental positions or is See, it should be a personal choice? But one difficulty is this. Lot of the laws made by the parliament and state legislatures 
stipulate a condition for a particular office, a sitting or a parking or date which is required. So long as the stipulation is there in the law, and the grant says that all good should accept it. Whether I accept it or not is my choice. I said, no, I don't want to involve you. But I can't decide for others. Uh, there is one more basic question. Mm -hmm. uh, one more basic question. Uh, usually, uh, people who don't know much about law, when they hear a uh, judgment from the court, uh, they are afraid of critiquing it because uh, they feel that they will be in the contempt of court. So, where does contempt of where is the line drawn and to what extent it should be? Any academic discussion of the judgment, the logic and correctness of the judgment, in my opinion, is not contempt of court. If you stop the implementation of a judgment, it could be condemned. Or if you scandalize the court, it is condemned. Academic criticism, okay, the judgment is wrong for X, Y, Z reasons, the logic is fallacious, it is wrong. There is nothing like it. There is nothing like condemned in that. At least I would never have a for condemned uh, on that chart. I will tell you something. Now we are almost 13 years. You remember the first election of Judge Bush? Algo contested the last election against you know, Judge Bush. There was some dispute about the legality of Judge Bush's election. The matter went up to the American Supreme Court. Bush won. Huge amount of literature was published on the judgment. One of the scholars uh, was teaching constitutional power, a man called Alexander Derijovich. He wrote an analysis of the judgment with a very interesting title, Supreme Injustice, that is the title of the book. He analyzed each one of the opinions given the judgment by the Supreme Court, there are five or six opinions, each one of the judgment, demonstrated by the established principles of law how this judgment is wrong. So, he demonstrated. No, whether the same standard would be applied in India or not, well, I don't know. I don't know. The American society is more liberal in these matters. They accept criticism more liberally. Well, as I told you, the Indian society is a society of very little equality, as the other side of the society. They are still immature to that level. But the point is, day to day, liberty never comes free. You have to assert your liberty. You have to go to jail for a day or two or a month. You prefer to lose it. Otherwise, you are sure to lose it anyway. <laughs> it is better to hide and go home. Without hiding, you can achieve my time in the way of holding it. Sir, sir. Sir, last question. Sir, sir. just relating to your answer. Yeah. Yeah. Just relating to your no, no, answer. No, no, no. Yes. Please, small. Please. 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 We can have the discussion. No, of course, I would say that. So my question is this, the safeguards that are mentioned in the Indian Constitution, the safeguards that are mentioned in the Indian Constitution, do they want to check some balances in the Constitution? Yes, they do. They do. Yes, they do. <laughs> and, and, and what if uh, those checks and balances are not implemented properly? What will happen? I am a PhD student in Systems and Control Engineering. Engineering. Okay. So you build a nuclear reactor and the productive war spray, what happens thereafter? That's what happens to every system. Everything fails when it is... Uh, hey, these things are designed with a certain hope and certain belief that human beings will try to become uh, wise by experience. People choose not to be wise, well, nothing can send them. <laughs> <laughs> this question was with respect to uh, reservations that have been considered as safeguards in the Indian Constitution. Indian Constitution mandates the reservation only in the rest of the world. The rest of it is the state to say, all the same.
Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm actually telling all of that. And I would like to tell you that Ambedkar Moore lecture is a part of Ambedkar Genesis Repression. APPSC, IATP will be organizing three more programs in upcoming three months. Especially in February, we are organizing a panel discussion on class feeling. We welcome you all and we expect your participation in our future programs. Now, I invite Naveen to go out of class. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am honored and privileged to have an opportunity to offer a vote of thanks during the inaugural Ambedkar Memorial Lecture at IIT Bombay. I, Navi Gurabu, on behalf of Ambedkar Kheria Police Study Circle, would like to first and foremost thank Justice Justice Chalmeshwar, former Justice Supreme Court of India, for kindly agreeing to take out one of the This thought-provoking lecture on seven decades of Indian Constitution, we believe, was the need of the hour. In the light of several issues around the idea of constitutional democracy at present. Thank you very much, sir. I especially like Justice Sarveshwar's speech, where he mentioned the political freedom will not survive unless we achieve social and economic equality. The way he explained the topic is exemplary. Next is our teaching faculty. No amount of gratitude is enough to express how privileged APPSC is to have the study solidarity of a lot of professors in IIT Bombay. They are the scientists and scholars who believe in the value of student activism for any campus to be truly totally democratic and equal. Without their support, it would have been unimaginable to conduct Ambedkar Memorial Lecture in this campus. Thank you, professors. A large section of IIT Bombay community has cooperated, informed and guided APPSC ever since its formation. We would like to take the name of Magar Sarvika Karamchari Sangatan MKS and Buddhist Cultural Association PCA. We have always welcomed APPSC to be part of their events and have always lent their helping hand during the crisis in the past. APPSC would like to thank MKS and BCA for their wholehearted support to AMM. Next, I would like to thank the student committee of IIT Bombay for showing their interest in this program. APPSC appreciate and value your presence and look forward to having many more of you in our future events. Once again, thank you very much to all who assembled this evening. Uh, currently, tea is served outside this hall on the ground floor.